Hello and welcome back everyone, we weep online and today I'm gonna continue the story What if Naruto was the legendary sensei part 2 If you enjoyed this video, please give it a big thumbs up and to watch more videos like this, subscribe to my channel and turn that bell notification on so you never miss an upload Now wasting no more time, let's begin As Mikoto blocked another blow from her sensei, she thought she heard her bones crack the Uchiha used to think that her sensei's training was crazy, but she now knows that Naruto has been taking it easy on them since he changed how they train. His new training level took crazy and turned it all the way up to 11, before breaking the dial that said 11, replacing it with one that went all the way to 100, and somehow moving it to 101, and then some. Some of the things he made them do seemed crazy and then crazy on top of that. Naruto called their training beyond the impossible. After they beat him in an 11-hour sparring match, he told them he wanted them to work on their taijutsu. When he told them this, he added that he would learn from Guy and Lee's techniques in this area. When they asked him who he was, he just laughed in a mean way, the same way he did before throwing exploding model cows at them. The three genin were right to be afraid for their lives at that moment. Mikoto didn't know who Guy and Lee were, but if this was how they trained, the men must be closer to beasts than humans. When she told Naruto this, he just smiled and said, green beasts, to be exact. Laughing at some kind of inside joke, Team 5 trained every day for the next month from 4am to 18.00 or 6pm. At the start of the day, Naruto went for a run, which he called relaxing. Naruto ran seven times around the whole village of Konoha, and when he said run, he meant sprint. Then they did Tejutsu Katas, and the blonde was still hard on them. They did them with weights, on water, while running, avoiding weapons thrown at them, and while jumping from tree to tree. Naruto would give them an exercise to do while doing the katas, and the blonde would laugh and tell them it would teach them the power of youth. All the while, he laughed like a madman. It goes without saying that everyone on the team wanted to kill him after the first day. Following the Tejutsu Katas, the blondes would practice controlling their chakra. They did everything from walking on water to balancing kunai, and Naruto even showed them some exercises they had never seen before. For example, you could float a sphere of water over your hand using only your chakra. Mikoto cursed Naruto because he didn't tell them that if they got it wrong, the sphere would blow up in their faces. At the end of the day, Naruto showed them some of his own style of teijutsu, but the blonde said he didn't have a name for it yet. When the month was over, the team celebrated, and Naruto told them that he would now move on to teaching them other things instead of trying to make them stronger. When the blonde told them that hell just got twice as hard now that they were strong enough to handle it, the cheers stopped right away. At that moment, they found out what hell was really like, the blonde wouldn't stop. For the next four months, he taught them everything he could think of, from more teijutsu to nin, Gen, Ken, and even Fuenjutsu. Hell the Blonde made his three genin master the first step of each of their nature manipulations in two months. Naruto's training was hard and always to the point. He didn't spare them anything. His constant monologue was always going on, and they were punished every time a block wasn't quite right. Every stance, form, and technique had to be done perfectly. Naruto didn't want or need that, but the Blonde insisted on it. He told his three genin how Tsunade had reacted when he put them in the Chunin exams. They used her reaction as motivation, pushing themselves to the limit to be better, faster, and stronger than any other genin team. Naruto saw how hard they were trying and used it to push them even harder, laughing out loud at his genin's bad luck. Then he laughed harder as he thought about how bad things would be for any genin who had to face them in the exams. Mikoto skidded along the ground before pushing herself up, snarling at the shadow clone in front of her and charging. The ground under her cracked from the force of her kicking off the ground. The girl with black hair closed in on the blonde and swung her left hand in a vicious hook at her face. Naruto's clone stepped back and let the attack pass over him before grabbing the offending arm. Unlike five months ago, Mikoto saw this as a chance. She used Naruto's grip to pull herself closer to the blonde and then threw a knee at her head. Naruto blocked with his left arm. Mikoto smiled and sent chakra to her eyes, turning them blood red and making two tomes spin slowly in each. She turned around, making him let her go, and then kicked him in the chest. As she did this, she saw Naruto move in slow motion, his hand coming up to guard. Mikoto changed the way she was coming at the clone, and at the last second, her kick went to the clone's ribs. Naruto smiled and almost seemed to flow around the attack. He spun and hit the black-haired girl in the stomach with a nasty heel kick. Spit flew out of her mouth, and Naruto nodded to himself. Since he only had a month and Mikoto was already fast enough, the clone told them to stop sparring. Okay, Mikoto-chan, that's enough, the Naruto clone said, and the Uchiha sat down gratefully. I know you three are going to need some kind of ace up your sleeve in the exams, so that's what we'll work on for the rest of the month. 
Baruto told the girl. It should also help you show the Uchiha clan that a lightning user is just as good as a fire user. Mikoto's eyes widened in surprise. Really, sir? Is it that thing you did with the Rasengan against Tusama? Mikoto asked. No, Naruto said, shaking his head. No, you won't learn the Rasengan just yet. But this attack is just as good, Naruto told the boy who was almost 13 but was still 12. If you weigh the pros and cons of the two attacks, they're about the same. But you should be able to use this attack better than the Rasengan because it is lightning-based. The Naruto clone continued his lecture before giving Mikoto a stern look. Mikoto, this attack is listed as a personal jutsu of mine, so under no circumstances are you to tell anyone about it or teach it to the other Achiha or anyone else. This move will only be used by you and me. The girl with black hair nodded excitedly and then looked at Naruto with suspicion. If you know that all three of us need a trump card, why are you only teaching me this attack? Mikoto asked. Naruto sighed and wiped his face with a hand. She was smart, he'd give her that. But what was more important was that she cared about her teammates. That was good, that was very good, the blonde took a deep breath. Those two will have their own trump cards. Kushina will have the racing gun, Naruto said, stopping Mikoto's complaints before they started. Listen to me, Mikoto. In the Chunin exams, you may have to show that you have a lightning-type chakra nature. If that happens, the clan will use what you told me against you, if what you told me is true. The Chidori attack I'll teach you is in a rank Raten Jutsu that can be used to kill someone. However, it has only one real weakness. The attack can't be used reliably without a sharing and to avoid any kind of counterattack. If the Uchiha clan sees a Raten technique like that coming from you, I think they'll let you stay in the clan. At the very least, such a powerful technique combined with Uchiha Daojutsu should shut them up. Naruto sighed and looked down at Mikoto. Now, are you ready to learn? The Uchiha eagerly nodded, and Naruto said, One more thing, do well, and I'll give you a gift. Nowaki looked at his sensei who was holding a pair of hook swords. They were an unusual weapon, which was why Naruto had given them to him. The Senju air charged forward, sword in hand. Naruto unsealed his own sword, an Okatana given to him by Mifune of Tetsu no Kuni when he finished his training. The two fought, and Nowaki was amazed. Every time Naruto dodged, it was by the. Naruto knew that Nowaki couldn't keep up with the Yuzugakure Jonin for much longer, so he put chakra draining seals on the two hook swords. This made it harder and harder for Nowaki to keep up with the Yuzugakure Jonin, but the seals were working. Every day, the Senju grew stronger and better at controlling his chakra. Even though Naruto didn't know it, the answer to that question was Nowaki. The last male Senju knew what his sister would do if she found out how Naruto trained. But he could tell from how much Naruto had improved that there was a method to his madness. So he protected Naruto from his sister's punches. Nowaki fell to his knees. Naruto looked at the Senju air and pulled out a storage scroll. He put some chakra into the seal matrix and took out a large rectangular black case. The blonde smiled at the Senju and said, Well, Nowaki, I think you will like this. The blonde threw the case at the Senju's feet. When Nowaki opened it carefully, his mouth dropped open, and he looked up at his sensei with nothing but gratitude in his eyes. Laying in the case were two of the most beautiful and deadly-looking swords Nowaki had ever seen. They were mirror images of each other, with the only difference being that one's hilt was wrapped in red leather and the other in blue. The crescent blades went over the knuckles, and the blade was straight most of the way, but there was a curved metal spike about 15 centimeters from the tip. Noaki couldn't see the seals, but he the real power of these beautiful creatures comes from their ability to take in and store your chakra. They do have a limit, but you won't reach it for a while. Noaki picked up the two swords with reverence, as if they were holy artifacts. Naruto gave the Senju his famous bring it sign. Noaki smiled and charged with swords in hand, and the dance of steel began again. Kushina cursed her sensei, and it wasn't the first time that day. The blonde had decided that Kushina's chakra control wasn't good enough and had her work on it. That was five hours ago. Not that Kushina would have minded that much. If her sensei said it needed work, then it needed work. She trusted Naruto enough to believe that. But this was crazy. Dodge. Naruto yelled and fired another jutsu at Kushina. She jumped off the water's surface to avoid it. This was how Naruto was training Kushina's chakra control. She would be standing on the water's surface, doing teijutsu katas, holding a ball of water over her fists with only chakra control, and dodging jutsu. Naruto jumped out of the water and punched the Yuzumaki in the face. Kushina jumped and kicked at the punch, sending it in a different direction. The redhead landed on her hands and used the force to spring her body off the water's surface and deep into Naruto's guard. She threw a vicious hook at the blonde's kidney, but Naruto's hand swept in low and deflected the fist harmlessly around Naruto yelled, Gakakayo no Jutsu. 
and fired another jutsu at the red head. Kushina did hand seals of her own and smiled as she saw the fireball coming closer. She said, Sutin, sewage and heki, and water sprayed, putting out the fire. Kushina immediately did a backwards roll to avoid the shurikens that cut through the steam. She did hand seals as she rolled back on the water's surface. The blonde jumped forward, landed on the water, and put one hand on the surface. Chidori Nagashi Naruto kept the voltage low enough that it wouldn't do any real damage, but it wouldn't have mattered either way. Kushina was already moving when she saw him land on the water. When Naruto knelt down and put his hands on the water's surface, Kushina ran as fast as she could to the shore. But her jump wasn't enough, and she could see herself falling back into the water. Naruto noticed that Kushina had done well. Even during their impromptu sparring, the water spheres on the backs of her hands never lost their shape or faltered. The blonde would be the first to admit that he never really had the chakra control for the racing gun, so he had to come up with his own ways of forming the attack, but his way of using the cage bunshin was a joke. Sure, it was creative, but the racing gun. The racing gun, on the other hand, did not use a speed style attack. This meant that to use the attack to its fullest potential, the user had to be able to form the racing in almost instantly, so that the opponent could not dodge the technique because the user was already too close to be dodged. This was why Naruto had pushed Kushina to learn chakra control more than the other two. Naruto, on the other hand, was willing to use Akane's chakra even though he didn't like it at first. Akane had told Naruto that Kushina hated Akane with a passion and would never, or very rarely, use her chakra on her own. This made chakra control even more important for the redhead, since she wouldn't have an endless supply of chakra like Naruto did. Naruto clapped for his student. Good job Kushi-chan, that's all the chakra control you have to do for now, the blonde said, smiling at the redhead. The redhead blushed slightly from being called Kushi-chan by the blonde. So how'd I do sensei? Kushina asked, and Naruto gave her a smile in response. Naruto smiled at Kushina and said, You did great, Kushina. In fact, you did so well that I think I can teach you something really cool. Kushina looked up at Naruto a little confused. What kind of cool thing are you doing, sensei? Naruto smiled and touched the tree next to the red head. Watch closely, all right. Naruto took a deep breath and pulled his right hand back before putting it forward palm facing the tree. The spinning blue orb of chakra formed half a second before Naruto's palm hit the tree, ripping through the bark and wood like a hot knife through butter. Naruto asked smirking. Kushina's eyes were so wide that they looked like they were about to fall out of her head. Before she pumped her fist into the air, she smiled like she had just won the lottery or become the first female Hakage. Hell yeah, Kushina said, smiling up at her sensei, who gave her one of his trademark fox-like grins and a quick thumbs up. Kushina would say that Naruto had become like family to the three genin. He was always willing to take time out of his day to help them get better or even just to talk. Since then, Kushina, Mikoto, and Nakai would drop by their blonde sensei's place every now and then. Naruto was always happy to have them, and it wasn't unusual for the three genin to spend an entire Sunday inside the blonde's apartment. Sunday was their day to relax and bond as a team, and the blonde never seemed to mind if they spent the day talking or watching a movie or something. Kushina's head was jerked out of the clouds when a water balloon hit the side of her head. The balloon didn't burst, but it did get Kushina's attention. Naruto smiled and threw another balloon up and down with his left hand, saying, Now that I have your attention, I'll tell you what I want to tell you. The next month was a blur of pain and exhaustion for the three genin as Naruto pushed them to master their new techniques. They no longer had days off to train with their families or just relax. Even their days off were taken up by Naruto's training. He pushed Makoto harder and harder to be faster and faster, knowing that her speed would be the deciding factor in any fight where the Chidori was used. Now the young Uchiha was no Rock Lee when it came to speed, but when Naruto considered it, who really was? But she was fast, very, very fast. If Naruto was to give a rough estimate on Makoto's speed the blonde would call her a mid chunin but for brief bursts she could push herself to high chunin that sprint was what Naruto wanted Mikoto to use when executing the Chidori. The blonde had toyed with the idea of teaching Mikoto other forms of the Chidori, but decided against it. The Chidori consisted of a series of 12 hand signs. Naruto could cut that down to three. As far as Naruto knew it was impossible to go any lower. At least he had never seen Kakashi or that bastard Sasuke go any lower than that. Though the blonde did admit that it was theoretically possible. But even if she wasn't able to cut it down to three hand seals Mikoto was more than passable. The young Uchiha had cut the hand seals down to nine, 
That was better than Sasuke was at her age. More importantly Makoto could use the Chidori three times in a day, one more than Sasuke could at her age. Naruto felt like doing a happy dance when he found that out. When he met Sasuke in the fiery depths of hell he would be able to say that he, Namikaze Uzumaki Naruto, had trained Sasuke's own mother to be better than him. That was going to be a special kind of revenge. All in all Naruto was more than happy with Mikoto's progress. She was more or less the Genin's team leader as well. Her level-headed thinking making up for her teammates' impulsiveness. For Nawaki, Naruto had punished the young Senju harshly. The Senju, like Kushina, was good with a blade, but it was overshadowed by his skills with Nin and Taijutsu. Nawaki did want to combine his ninjutsu and kenjutsu to make a more versatile fighting style, so Naruto taught him how to use hook swords. Hook swords were not very common, so not many people knew how to use them. Naruto had taught the young Senju as much as he could, mostly focusing on his kenjutsu and how to make chakra strings. Nawaki would need the chakra strings for the trump card that Naruto wanted to teach him. Unlike the Chidori or the Rasengan, this attack was truly his own. It was also probably the only jutsu in the world that could be either an E or a S ranked jutsu, depending on the user. Add to that some extra lessons on both ninjutsu and teijutsu, and the senju was a force to be reckoned with. More importantly it should be more than enough to completely decimate any of the opponents that Nawaki could face in the Chunin exams. Though what Naruto really wanted to see was Nawaki versus anyone from Tsunade's genin team. Naruto was sure that the senju air would decimate them in short order. He just hoped he had a camera and Tsunade was around when it happened. Naruto had taught Kushina everything he knew, from fighting to Kenjutsu to the Rasengan. It had taken Kushina three and a half weeks to be able to use the Rasengan correctly, meaning that it didn't blow up in her face. But she did it, and Naruto had spent the last few days teaching her how to do it faster. Naruto was also happy to see that Kushina could fight with the best Genin's Kiri when it came to Kenjutsu. The redhead was a little too short to fight with Naruto's favorite weapon, an Okatana, so the Narukami had to come up with an alternative. Kushina now fought with three weapons, two Wakazashis for close quarters fighting and a single Katana. Kushina's ninjutsu wasn't very good, but Naruto knew that probably wouldn't change. Kushina was only bad at jutsu that required a lot of hand seals, so as long as Naruto stuck to shape and nature manipulations, the redhead wouldn't have any real problems. This was good, because Naruto was very good at those things. Naruto wasn't sure if Mifune would agree, but the old man was usually good about things like that. Most likely, Mifune would agree to teach his genin in exchange for Naruto doing a few things for Tetsu no Kuni, and Naruto would be happy to help. Tetsu was a good country where people didn't fight with each other for no reason, and the samurai had a strong sense of honor and loyalty. Naruto sighed. How did this happen again? The blonde looked down at Kushina and Mikoto sleeping on his chest. The three of them still had all their clothes on, so that was one theory out the window. They were 13, for Kami's sake. If Naruto had done that with Mikoto or Kushina, he would have felt like a cradle robber. The blonde sighed and looked up at his ceiling. Yes, all four members of Team 5 were in Naruto's apartment. Yesterday was the last day of training for the three genin because the chunin exam started the next day. Naruto had a fun day because he just let the genin pull him around, but he was sad that Ikaraku Ramen hadn't opened yet. He didn't know what he would do if Ikaraku Ramen never opened again. The three genin took him to lunch first, arguing over where to eat. Naruto hit all three of them on the head and took them to the Golden Leaf, which is arguably the best restaurant in Kanoha. Before telling the three genin to go nuts, he told them that he would pay for their meal today. They deserved it for surviving Naruto's brutal training, and he had a feeling that Tsunade hadn't tried to kill him yet because Nawaki. After that, both Nawaki and he were dragged around by Mikoto on a shopping trip. Luckily for them, Mikoto was a Kanoichi, so they didn't have to deal with a lot of clothes. Instead, they spent their time looking at Shuriken, Kunai, and other things that could stab or explode. Naruto did tell his genin team not to buy any explosive notes, but Naruto wasn't a seal master in Wasan. Kushina declared that she wanted to relax after their little impromptu shopping trip, so they dumped everything inside Naruto's apartment, before heading to the hot springs, but not before Naoto set a barrier over the women's side. Even if he would never admit it Naruto thought of Jiraiya as a father, so he put the barrier up for the old pervert's benefit. If anyone tried peeking it would look like the woman's side was filled with fat old ladies. This was better for Jiraiya than the alternative. After all Naruto would hate to have to beat his father figure to death for peeking on his students. Still he could only do that if he got to the man before Kushina and Mikoto. 
Actually now Naruto thought about it maybe he should let Jiraiya get himself caught. It would be interesting to find out what a Rasengan did to the male reproductive system and he was sure that if Jiraiya was caught peeking on her, Kushina would show him exactly what would happen when the Rasengan was applied directly to Jiraiya's balls. At the end of the day, the four of them watched movies in Naruto's apartment and ate takeout ramen. Kushina and Mikoto must have fallen asleep while doing that, because Naruto looked down again and smiled at how happy Kushina and Mikoto looked. It was 10 in the morning, and they didn't have to be at the academy until 3. But if the blonde went back to sleep, neither Naruto nor any of his students would Naruto-sensei. How did you get into my room? Naruto laughed nervously. Um, Kushina, this is my apartment, and you're kind of sleeping on me. Would you mind getting off, please? Naruto asked. Kushina looked down at where she was, then looked up at Naruto, then looked down again and turned to red so bright it made her hair look pale. Kushina's embarrassed scream, followed by Mikoto's, and the sound of Nowaki's hysterical laughter woke up the rest of the people in the apartment, and the apartment block. Naruto sighed while cooking breakfast for four. Kushina was currently using his shower while Nawaki waited for his turn and Mikoto was helping him by making pancake batter. How had this happened? When he woke his team up Naruto had expected them all to go home then he would meet them again for the Chunin exams in a few hours. That, needless to say, had not happened. The three all opting to stay at his apartment and get ready there. Naruto's argument that they needed to go get clothes and more importantly more equipment such as ration bars, kunai, etc. was shut down when Kushina revealed that the three had been stashing things like that in Naruto's apartment for months now. In a bunch of storage scrolls in his spare room, in a wardrobe he didn't know he even had, containing clothing Naruto knew was not his. How the hell did he miss them bringing a wardrobe into his apartment, and putting storage scrolls and clothing in it as well? He was a S-rank ninja kami dammit. He should pick up on things like this. He must have been slipping. A thought like that did not sit well with Naruto. The three genin rushed out of the apartment after breakfast without helping Naruto clean up. They ran straight to the academy. Naruto looked at the time, which was 1 o'clock. If they walked, which they probably would, it would take them between 30 and 40 minutes to get there. He sighed and looked at the dishes, then made the famous cross-shaped hand sign. Cage Bunshin. Narukami Naruto's answer to all questions. Naruto looked at the clock and saw that it was almost two. He stood up and put his hands together. Naruto looked over his shoulder at the two clones who were still cleaning and said, Lock the door before you pop. The two clones gave him a chorus of high before he left for the academy in a shunshin, a flash of light going with him. Naruto spread out his awareness, looking for his genin's chakra. The blonde sighed and looked up as Kushina came into view and gave a lazy wave. Huh, sensei, what are you doing with her? Nawaki asked as he came into view. Naruto smiled at them. The three of them were ready, they were going to do great, and there would be no invasion, so at least they could become chunin. Naruto smiled at the three of them and said, just some last minute advice, Nawaki kun He then nodded to himself and turned his attention to Mikoto. You have a clear head and can quickly and accurately assess a situation. It also helps that you are not too quick to act. Keep your cool, stay focused, and make sure they don't go crazy, and you should all be fine. Mikoto-chan, when it comes to battle, I only have one thing to say, no one should be faster than you. Naruto smiled at the raven-haired girl, who smiled back at him. Naruto looked at Noaki. Noaki-kun, you're the all-arounder of the team. You're good at everything, so you can handle almost any situation that comes your way. So, for now, I want you to only use the swords as a last resort. In round 3, have something to surprise your opponent with, okay. Aside from that, your chakra is much higher than it should be for a genin, so if the worst happens, you should be able to outlast the opponent. Nawaki nodded at Naruto and put his hand on the scroll that held his swords. Kashina, you're the strongest player on the team. You have the most power of the three of you, and your chakra is the strongest. You should be able to bulldoze through the opposition if you need to, but don't forget that finesse has its place and that you should use it. Other than that, you shouldn't use your katana or wakizashi unless you have no other choice. Keep something as a trump card in addition to the other thing, Kushina said. Naruto looked at his team one last time and nodded. One last piece of advice, stick together and work as a group. Always keep in mind that people who break the rules are trash, but people who leave their friends behind are worse than trash. Kick their asses hard, Naruto said with a smile as he turned and opened the door to the exam room. The three genin gave Kasama a run for his money with their bloodthirsty grins. Hello, Naruto-sensei. Naruto's smile disappeared as soon as his genin walked through the exam doors. The Yuzugakure Jonin put some of his chakra into the seal on his wrist, and the Okatana fell into his hand where he was waiting. Naruto inhaled deeply. When he spread his awareness out, he felt them. 
They were chakra signatures that shouldn't be here. Thanks to Akane's ability to feel hatred, Naruto could tell a lot about a person just by feeling their chakra. The chakra he felt from these people was cold and emotionless, almost like it came from a robot. Only the root sect of Shinobi had given him those feelings in his own world. The blonde then ran away as fast as she could. Time to find out what that damn warhawk wanted from the Chunin exams. They had tried to take Kushina before, but Naruto wasn't going to let it happen again. Naruto dropped silently behind the root ninja. From there, he could see right into the room where the examinees were. Naruto saw the knee mark on the ANBU's mask, so he thrust his O katana forward and cut the man's spine. His cage bunchens did the same thing in five other places, or almost all of them did, since one of them only knocked the ninja out. Naruto wanted to show the man to the sand dam. This would put the old man on Danzo's case and, hopefully, make the old fool think twice about his actions. The last thing Naruto needed was for Danzo to mess up the chances of his genin. Before jumping off, the blonde bent down and put the body in a storage scroll. He needed to get to the Jonin sensei's room before anyone got suspicious. As he jumped, Naruto made another cage bunshin and gave the scroll to the clone, telling it to give it to the old monkey. A shunshin later, Naruto was waiting outside the waiting room for the Jonin sensei. The blonde yawned as he walked in. The room was simple, with a lot of seats and a screen that showed what was happening in the exam room. Naruto yawned again before he looked at the Jonin in the room. There were a little more than a hundred of them, and he saw Jiraiya, Tsunade, and a Uchiha he didn't know right away. Still, the guy looked like he had a stick so far up his arse that Naruto would have needed a mining license to pull it out. The blonde's eyes kept moving. Four of them were looking at Tsuna, six at Aim, four at Kiri, eight at Kumo, and three at Iwa. After what he tried to do, that old jerk Noki had balls of solid titanium to send his gen into Konoha. Naruto could see two villages from Taki and a few more that he didn't know. Naruto couldn't see anything from Uzu, but that was to be expected. Even though Naruto had scared Iwa away, they had still attacked Uzu. The Uzukich probably didn't want even one Jonin to be outside of Uzu right now because it could be dangerous. But when Kushina made it to the finals, Naruto was sure that Dat would go see her. He knew that Dat would go even if Kushina didn't, but he hadn't told the girl because he wanted it to be a surprise for her. As he sat down, Naruto gave Jiria a lazy wave, and the white-haired man nodded and walked over to the blonde. Jiria said with a smile, you've got balls, kid, to put your team in the exam after only six months of training. Jiria asked, do you think they're ready? The man sounded genuinely worried. Naruto didn't know if it was because Tsunade was worried about Nakai, or because Minato already liked Kushina, and he wasn't sure he cared. Naruto asked, Jiria-san, you only gave your team six months to train. Why didn't you give them more time? Jiria shrugged and sat down next to the blonde. That's right, the man with white hair said. That being said Minato and Hayashi are geniuses in their own right and Tsum isn't that far behind them in terms of skill. Hell they even managed to complete a C rank with no support from me. And now that was a good mission. All I had to do was sit back and let the genin do all the heavy lifting. Jiria finished. Naruto smirked inside his head. So Jiria wanted to compare mission records did he? Too bad for the old man with white hair. Naruto knew that his team had done the most C ranks. How many missions has your team done so far? Jiria Sam. Naruto asked. The white-haired man puffed out his chest proudly. Jiria said with pride, I have 32 D ranks and 4 degrees Celsius ranks. Tsunade moved closer. Naruto smiled and said, Well, then Jiria-san, my team has the upper hand. So far, we've done 13 C rank missions and no D rank missions. Jiria's jaw got to know the floor very well. The white-haired man asked, What the hell? You know you can't even take a C rank until you've done 20 D ranks, right? Naruto just gave him a shrug in response. Actually, you can, but it's not a good idea, the blonde told his older friend, whose face looked like it had been stabbed. Jiria asked Naruto, don't you think that's a little careless? Naruto had to hold back his laughter. Yes, the great toad sage Jiria was talking to him about responsibility. He was the one who threw him off a cliff in the hopes of getting some of Akane's chakra. Even though it was about the godfather, the blonde was still a little upset when he found out. Not really, Naruto said. I knew their limits and their strengths and weaknesses, so I knew they were ready for it. Jiria, on the other hand, didn't seem to believe him. But I still think, Naruto decided to stop him there. Naruto asked, Jiria-san, do you train Team 5? Jiria looked at him like he was crazy. The man with white hair said, no, of course not. I'm the sensei of Team 7. He looked a little confused by Naruto's question. Okay, then, have you ever seen Team 5 train or fight? Jiria shook his head, and Naruto let out a sigh. 
Then why are you questioning my methods? I know what they are capable of because I trained them. I have taught them a lot, in some cases from the ground up. Jiria, I know you are doing this out of concern for the genin, and I thank you for that. But I know they can do this, so please, until you can come up with a good reason for me to keep them out of the exams, keep quiet. Jiria said to the blonde, I just hope you know what you're doing. The white-haired man nodded and sighed. I just hope you know what you're doing. Naruto nodded and looked at the screen. He wondered what they were going to do for the first test. As they went into the exam room, Kushina stopped, and the redhead counted at least 50 different teams. But from what she knew about the final round of the test, it sounded like a one-on-one -on -one tournament. One that lasted only one day, which meant that there could be no more than 20 matches that day. Since the tournament had to end on the same day it began, the final round could have no more than 12 players. That meant that the first two tests would cut the number of candidates down by a lot. Kushina looked around. Her sensei had taught her a lot about battle strategies, and now they told her to figure out who had the best chance of making it to the final rounds. Kushina chose to pay attention to the teams from Konoha. In the end, she did know the most about them. She took a close look at Namikaze Minato, Hyuga Hayashi, and Inuzuka Tsum on Team 7. The redhead knew that they would make it to the final round. Minato was smart, she wouldn't argue with that. With the Byakugan's ability to see where enemies were coming from and Tsum's and Yuzuka traits, the team would be almost impossible to catch off guard. Most of the time, when their enemies tried to ambush them, they would be turned back on the attackers. With Minato's intelligence and skill with the Namikaze clan's futon techniques, Hayashi's skill with the Jaken, and Tsum's skill with the Inuzuka Teijutsu style, the ambushers would quickly be torn apart. The redhead made sure to remember that if she met them in an exam, just because they looked like easy targets probably meant they were setting a trap. The fourth team, made up of Uchiha Teaki, Junishi Ami, and Khan, wasn't very good. She had Noaki do some research on them. None of them were as strong as Tsunade, but they all knew how to use chakra scalpels well. Plus, Makoto had told her that Teaki had turned on his Sharingan, which gave him two tomes in his left eye and one in his right. The only other thing Makoto knew about him was that he was good at controlling Katen, Jikeki no Jutsu, which was the style that the Uchiha clan liked. It looked like the Uchiha could use it as both a ball of fire and a concentrated stream, like a flamethrower. Junishi Ami was a member of the Kirama clan, which used Jinjutsu. Even though she was a branch member of a small side family, it seemed that, like the Sharingan, she could put a person under a Jinjutsu just by looking at them in the eyes. Lastly, Khan has above average Teijutsu, above average Ninjutsu, and below average Ninjutsu because his chakra reserves are small. His smaller reserves gave him more control, and Kushina would have to be on guard because his Teijutsu and chakra scalpels were better than average. The best way to fight the medical team would be from a long distance. If that wasn't possible, you could use weapons instead. With chakra scalpels, it would be stupid to fight them straight up with Teijutsu. Team 13, made up of Uchiha Fugaku, a Burame Shibai, and a Kamichi Shomai, was the third and last Konoha team that could make it to the finals. Kushina did think for a moment about where Shikaku, Choza, and Inoichi were, but she quickly put the thought out of her mind. Their sensei probably didn't want them to take the exams until they had more experience. At any rate, she knew everything there was to know about Fugaku's skills because of Mikoto. Shomai was an Aburame, so it's likely that he was one of the best trackers in the room. Well, the man was in a Kamichi, so it was clear that he could use his clan's multi-size techniques. He was probably also very good at Teijutsu, so they would have to be careful if they had to fight him up close. Kushina sighed and wondered if there were preliminary rounds. If she was right and her team and these three made it to the finals, they might need them. Even though she could see some of the other genin, she knew this was going to be fun. All of the training they had been through was hell, so this should be like a walk in the park. She got rid of that idea by shaking her head. Naruto had told her over and over that being too sure of yourself could kill you. Mikoto leaned in and asked, anyone we should be on the lookout for? Kushina gave a nod. No, only the ones we talked about earlier, the others don't pose much of a threat. As for the other villages, I don't even know where to start. The Konoha teams are definitely a threat, though, so we need to keep an eye out for them. Mikoto nodded, then looked at Kushina again. Do you think they are going to come after us? Asked the raven-haired beauty, tilting her head slightly toward Team 7. Kushina bit her bottom lip. It had been a long time, and she hoped it was finally over. At least she hoped it was over, but clans could keep a grudge longer than anyone else. I don't know, but if Minato wanted to make me look bad, he would wait until the third round, Mikoto said. She nodded and turned to Nowaki to tell her what Kusuna thought would happen. 
Namikaze Minato might have wanted to make Kusuna look bad for a very simple reason. She had, in a way, insulted the Namikaze clan and its heir, I, E, him. In a bit of a political power play, the Namikaze had sent a marriage proposal to her father, the current head of the Uzumaki clan, to try to get Minato and her married. This was, of course, a political move. It was an attempt by the Namikaze to get more power in Konoha and a foothold in Uzu. Dad asked her what she thought, but Kushina flatly refused. Kushina didn't dislike Minato as a person, but she wasn't going to say she wanted to spend the rest of her life with him before she knew him better. So, the marriage proposal was turned down because the Namikaze didn't want to wait. Kushina didn't even know if Minato knew about it because clans often married off their children without telling them first. But since the redhead had never really talked to the blonde, even after she turned down his proposal, she didn't know if he felt hurt or not. If Minato did feel insulted by her, he might try to get back at her in the exam, even though Kushina had some doubts about this, because the boy had never tried anything before. And even though he was a little cold to her, this wasn't a surprise. Kushina had more important things to think about, so she went back to watching the other genin. Someone was bound to do something stupid and give away an ability or two, and if that didn't happen, it was always fun to watch two people beat each other senseless in a Teijutsu match. When Naruto saw Kushina looking over the teams, he smiled. Most likely, they are looking at some of the competition and putting them in order of how dangerous they are. Hell, Naruto was doing it himself. So far, he had counted three teams from Konoha, two from Kiri, one from Kumo, two from Suna, one from Aim, and possibly one more from Iwa that would make it to round two, or more accurately, had the best chance of making it past round two. Naruto had to hold back a laugh when he saw a younger B it looked like B hadn't started rapping yet, so maybe Naruto could stop him from rapping before he did. When an ANBU fell next to him, it scared some of the Jonin. The boar masked ANBU bowed to the blonde who was sitting down. If it's okay with you, Narukami-san, the Sandame would like to see you in his office. Naruto nodded and said, sure, I'll be there shortly. As he used Shunshin, his hands came up into the ram hand seal. They vanished in a flash of lightning, which scared some of the Jonin who were already nervous and made Jiria's hair stand on end from the static electricity. Jiria sighed and put a hand on his head to feel his hair, which was more spiky than usual. Jiria grumbled, I bet he did that on purpose. He wasn't wrong. When Naruto showed up, he was already bowing to the Hakage. You called Saru Tobai-sama, Naruto said, looking down like an ANBU waiting for orders. Haruzen took a moment to look at Naruto, and then said in a serious voice, This is important business right now, Naruto-san. Please call me Hakage-sama for the rest of this meeting. Naruto nodded to say that he understood. Of course, Hakage-sama, Naruto said, keeping his eyes on the floor. What do you want from me? Haruzen took a big breath in and then let it out again. Jonin Narukami Naruto of Yuzugakir no Sato, you were responsible for the deaths of five root shinobi, and the capture of one, right? Naruto nodded. You are right, Hakage-sama, he said. The shinobi gave a nod. Do you know what these people were planning to do or what they were doing where they were? No, Hakage-sama. All I knew was that they were breaking the law and needed to be stopped. I will admit that the fact that they had attacked my team in the past did affect my decision but I still think what I did was right. Haruzen agreed and let out a sigh. The Sandam Hakage of Kano Hagakure, Sarutobai Haruzen, said, then, John and Narukami, I, Sarutobai Haruzen, give you this S-rank mission. Naruto nodded to show that he was willing and ready to accept. During the second exam in training ground 44, you are to follow Team 5. If any shinobi, rude or not, try to kidnap a member of Team 5 and leave the village with them, they are to be killed. I trust you to know what is and isn't okay within these parameters. Naruto nodded. Of course, Hakage-sama. I'll be ready to start right away. Naruto made another hand seal and used Shunshin to go back to his apartment. He was going to need some supplies in case things got bad fast. Nawaki was getting antsy. What the hell was taking so damn long? They had already been waiting for 20 minutes. The exam was supposed to start at 3 p.m. or 15.00 hours. It was almost 3.20 and Nawaki was getting a little nervous. The genin in the room didn't know that the janin weren't coming in on purpose. Instead, they were waiting for a fight to start so that the tension would be at its highest for the test. Well, that and they were betting on how long it would take for the genin to start fighting with each other. As expected, someone did something stupid in the end. In this case, some tacky ninja insulted Hanzo in front of the aim ninja, which was a bad idea. 
The aim ninja didn't bother to come back with words. Instead, he went straight for the blades. If you could call it a fight, it was over in three and a half seconds. The aim Jenin's first move was to draw a ninjato. The tacky nin's second move was to take a defensive stance and the Chunin's third move was to knock both of the other ninja out. When Nakai heard the two people's heads hit the ground, he winced. Kami, that sounded painful. The Chunin stood still and looked at the other four members of his team. Take these two bags of crap and get out. If they can't even follow simple instructions like wait, they're not ready for Chunin. Now get out. The four remaining team members went to argue, and the Chunin's friends quickly knocked them out. The man gave a quick nod to his two partners and then faced the group of Jenin. This year's test is being run by the head of the Torture and Interrogation Department, Maureen Hibiki. Because of this, we will be keeping a close eye on you all. The test is simple, each team will be given a piece of information to memorize. Then, a member of each team will be chosen at random and interrogated by members of the other team. Any and all forms of interrogation are allowed. As for why we will be watching you, it's pretty simple. If one team gets the information but their team member who is being interrogated also cracks, and the same thing happens to the other team, we will use our observations to decide who wins. Oh, I almost forgot, my name is Yamanaka Fuen, and if you have any questions about the exam, please keep them to yourself because I won't answer them. All the information you needed was in the explanation I just gave you five minutes ago. Missed it. Well, that's just too fucking bad. Nawaki looked at his two teammates, who seemed kind of happy about how their test was going. Why Kami? Why did he always get the crazy ones? First it was his sister, then Mikoto and Kushina, and most recently it was his sensei. He should have gotten a break by now, right? When Nawaki unrolled one of the scrolls, he almost fell on his face. What the hell kind of secret message was that? Now, Nawaki didn't have any proof that Nartuto did this, but he still blamed him for it. By sheer experience, he was able to find out who was really to blame. The message came through loud and clear. At dawn, the ramen moves. Nawaki was a good boy. What the hell did he do to deserve this? In any case, he cursed his almost official sensei for this. Nawaki cursed him very strongly and wished him some kind of physical harm. On the other end of the emotional spectrum, Kushina was overjoyed that someone, probably her sensei based on how he handled it, took ramen so seriously. After all, making ramen was a big deal. Nawaki sighed and memorized the scroll before setting it on fire with a low-level katanjutsu that was quick and didn't need a seal. Fire was such a great element. Oh, all the ways it could be used to destroy large areas. Nawaki pulled himself away from thoughts of large-scale destruction by fire, no matter how nice they were. After all, who doesn't like explosions? The Senju looked back at the Chunin, who was standing at the front of the room. Okay, maggots, one of your teams will be picked at random to be questioned by someone else. At the same time, your little secret keeper will be taken away from you and talked to, he said with a cruel smile. Nawaki shivered. Okay, that was creepy. Team 4's three genin waited and waited and waited. They almost didn't care about being interrogated and just wanted to be called up. It would be nice to see something happen, but the world is often a numbers game, and there were only 30 interrogation rooms at the time. Each team had 20 minutes to figure out what the information was. With 143 teams in the room, it would take, if all of them used the whole 20 minutes, about 2 hours. Okay, so it wasn't that long, but they were going crazy from not doing anything. When it was finally their turn, the Chunin smiled. It was weird, but it wasn't like Narukami Naruto laughing hysterically while yelling about youth or throwing exploding model cows at them, so the genin weren't too scared. Even though everyone shook when they thought about it, they just hoped that time would dull the horror or that they would see something that would make them forget, whichever came first. The man seemed a little annoyed that they didn't notice his smile, but he quickly got over it. Okay, girls, you're in charge of questioning these little tacky ninja, the Chunin said with a quick sideways gesture. Senju, you're a punching bag, get inside. The force of the punch made Nawaki's head snap back, and he smiled. He would never say it out loud because he didn't want to give the man false hope, but he would privately admit that he was glad for the physical training they were given. Compared to when his sensei hit him, the tacky ninja's punches felt like love taps. Nawaki sent his chakra to his fingers. He was held by a rope and had his hands and feet tied together, but he could still work with this. The senju made a chakra string out of nothing but cat and nature chakra. They did this with the utmost care. Before he used it to cut through his chains, he left them in place to make it look like he was still bound. The tacky nin punched again, but Nawaki moved this time. Just before the punch, the senju moved his body forward and hit the tacky nin in the family pride. The pain made the boy double over, and Nawaki's knee hit the genin in the face. The senju jumped off of the ninja's back and grabbed the other person. 
The tacky Jenin was on the ground when Nawaki twisted and punched him in the face, breaking the cartilage in his nose. He then slammed the tacky Jenin's head into the concrete, knocking him out. The Senju got up, dusted himself off, and spit out some blood before lightly knocking on the door. When the door opened, Chunin was there, but he looked bored. Done already, Sen was all he could say before Nawaki left the room, leaving the two injured tacky Nin behind. The Chunin looked at the boy for a second before looking into the room and seeing the down ninja. The Chunin said, well, that's a first, then called another team over. When Naruto fell, he landed in his apartment. It looked like he would have to take something seriously for the first time in a long time. Naruto took off his casual clothes and walked into his room. His room was pretty simple, with just a bed, closet, and a small desk and chair in the corner. At least, that's all most people could see when Naruto let them. Even his Jenin didn't know how much of a weapons store the room was. The blonde pulled out a quanny and cut his hand, then put it on a part of the wall that looked like any other. Kai, said the blonde, and black lines wound their way around all four walls of the room. The window was covered with a funinjutsu barrier so that no one could see in. The black lines were stacked on top of each other, making a pattern that was so complicated and intricate that it was amazing. There was a small blast of smoke, and the four empty walls were now filled with rows and rows of weapons on each one. Hundreds of kunai and shuriken, exploding tags, ninja wire, barrier tags, razor wire, garot wire, tantos, wakazashis, kodachas, katanas, okatanas, scimitars, arrows, bows, armor of different sizes and shapes, throwing knives, hidden blades, poisons, paralyzing potions, and healing elixirs. In terms of weapons, the room had literally everything Naruto could ever need. The blonde walked over to a rack of armor and put on the suit quickly. He wore mottled gray pants and a shirt, a thick cloak to hide his face and body, a pair of black combat boots, and ANBU gloves without fingers to cover his hands. Next, Naruto got his weapons. He decided that it was better to be safe than sorry, so he packed like he was going to war. Each arm has a hidden blade, and it's easy to get to 24 throwing knives. Hook swords on his back, a wakazashi on his hip, and a chokut connecting the two. A few hundred kwani and shuriken, his okatana, and some explosive notes were all kept in seals on his body. Naruto sighed and shook his head as he picked up a bottle of black hair dye. To avoid more suspicion, he would probably have to make his hair straight as well as black. He might kind of look like a Achiha. Dear, sweet Kami, he hoped that those little jerks would enjoy this. Mikado yawned and waited for the last few teams to finish their interrogation tests. It had not been hard to get the information from the Takinin they had been given. Then again, she did have Yuzumaki Kushina, the prank princess from hell, and the sadistic traits she got from being Narukami Naruto's student. A few threats here, a couple of Raiden enhanced finger strikes to the Genin's sense of family pride and the tacky nin folded like wet paper, ah, memories. Nawaki left the room where they were questioning him not long after they were done. Kushina and Makoto didn't even think he had told them anything. Three genin were yawning. This was very, 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 very boring. Kushina looked around the room again. There were about 114 people there, so this test would cut them in half, from 114 to 57. That was good, because she was worried about the next test. It would have to get rid of enough people to be fair, which means it would have to be much harder than the ones that came before. The person in charge of the Chunin exam, Fuen, walked to the front of the room. Congratulations, you've passed the first stage of the Chunin exams. Now, let me introduce you to your second exam proctor, Orochimaru. As Fuen stood aside, a hissing serpent rose from the ground and bared its fangs at the genin. Before it seemed to throw up, the snake started shaking all along its length. Then, as it regurgitated a body covered in its own juices, it seemed to throw up. Orochimaru stood up and wiped off the snake poison, which made the genin around him angry. Orochimaru said, they are such cute little kids, as he licked his lips and looked over the group of genin. Everyone on Team 5 shook when he said that. Orochimaru waved for the genin to leave, and they did. They ran all the way to training ground 44. Fuen smiled as he looked at Orochimaru. The Yamanaka asked, was it really necessary to scare them that much? Orochimaru just shrugged. Not really, no, but it was fun if nothing else. Naruto grunted as he blocked another attack from a root member. He had already gone into the forest of death to wait for his team. Until he felt the chakra of the root shinobi, he didn't go after them. When Danzo tried to take Kusuna all those months ago, he made this personal. Now that Naruto was free to fight Root as long as he took care of Team 5, the blonde planned to fight a private war against that useless Warhawk. Still, he only had until the second exam to do it, and Danzo only had so much Root ANBU, so he was going to run out sooner or later. The blonde jumped back to avoid the Katanjutsu that hit the ground in front of him. 
Naruto smiled. It was one against five, and you had to feel bad for those root members. The five masked shinobi slowly went around him. Naruto drew his own hook swords out of their sheaths at the same time he pulled out the ninjato. The shinobi with the blonde hair that had turned black took a deep breath. He didn't know if this would work, and it was just a trick he had learned from a Kami rest his soul. Naruto had never had time to learn more than the theory of the attack, but the blonde was willing to bet that what he did know would be enough for the five in front of him. Great and Chakra circled his fists and feet, but it couldn't go any further. Naruto couldn't stop grinning savagely. It wasn't Raiden no Yoroi, but it was a start. Naruto could see that the techniques were different, and the said that using Raiden no Yoroi made you faster and stronger. In addition, if you use Raiden Chakra to speed up your natural synapses, it makes your reaction time much faster. Not only that, but since the Raiden Chakra was going around your body, it did exactly what its name said it would, it protected you. By giving the jutsu a way to defend itself, it really was an amazing technique. At least at the time, Naruto's version of it was at best a pale copy. His Raiden Chakra only covered his fists and feet. This made him faster and stronger, but not as fast or strong as a true Raiden no Yoroi. He still had a long way to go before he reached that level. Naruto disappeared from the ANBU's sight, leaving a trail of sparks behind him. He then appeared in front of the lead root ANBU and hit the man in the face with his fist. The man's head caved in when Raiden's chakra-powered punch crushed his brain, turning it into mush and killing the root member on the spot. The blonde disappeared again in a blur. A pained yell and the sound of something snapping let the other four root know he was there. The three of them turned around to see the blonde with his arm stuck up to his elbow in the middle of one of their teammates. The blonde blurred again, and his fist came back as he landed in front of another root member. The root member held up his ninjato in a weak attempt to defend himself. Naruto's fist came forward, and the Raiden chakra around it disappeared. Naruto's eyes got big, and he twisted his arm, but instead of getting a big gash, he only got a small cut. The Uzumaki put his kai into a seal on his left wrist, and a kunai fell into his ready hand. The blade came up and cut through the ninjato before slicing off the root ninja's head. The blade was covered in nature chakra from the futon right away. Naruto jumped away from his most recent kill and turned to face the two root members who were still alive. He didn't seem to be able to keep up his partial rate in no yoroi for more than a few seconds before it gave out on him. It looked like he would need to work on it more. He moved his right hand, taking the chokut from his hip and holding it behind his back. Naruto put his futon chakra into the blade, which gave it a sharp outline of ocean blue. He went after the last two root ANBU, ducking low under the first blow from one of them before spinning and putting the still futon chakra coated kanai into the back of the man's head. Naruto jumped forward and landed in front of the last root ANBU. The Chokudo came up and cut the man in half from his right hip to his left shoulder. The blonde jumped back to avoid the blood and organs that fell from the man's body. Naruto felt a light tingle in the back of his mind. The cage bunchen he had left at the genin gathering had just gone away. The blonde ran toward the place where they were supposed to meet. It was time for him to watch over his genin. He wouldn't do anything drastic unless Root attacked them, but he wouldn't let his genin die here because he had made them a promise they would keep for the rest of their lives. Kushina looked annoyed as she waited for the second round to start. So far, all of the teams she had been keeping an eye on had moved on to the next round, just as she had predicted. But she couldn't stop thinking, what the hell were they doing here? Kushina knew everything there was to know about training ground 44, since it was the only one Naruto told them to stay away from. If her crazy sensei told her not to do something, she was damn well not going to do it. After all, the blonde's actions always made sense, and Kushina was sure this was no different. The redhead did wonder why the Iwa Genin were staring at her with hate, though. Naruto never told her that he was the one who fought for Uzu. At first, it was because he didn't want to influence her opinion of him before they had a chance to get to know each other. Naruto wasn't a fool, even when he thought he had only gone back in time. Kushina, his mother, and Kushina, his student, were very different people, so he wanted to get to know this Kushina without her having any ideas about him. After that time passed, the blonde's reasons changed. Dat, Kushina's father and the current head of the Uzumaki clan, told him not to say anything to the red head. The man decided he wanted to tell Kushina in person about what almost happened to Uzu. Because of this, the Yuzukij decided to go to Konoha himself to tell his daughter and to see her. When Naruto asked the Hakage about this, he was sure that Dat wouldn't want to leave his village after it almost got attacked. Haruzen had told him that everything would be fine because there would be two more battalions of a NBU stationed at Yuzugakure for the duration of the Yuzumaki's trip. Somewhat calming the hidden Yuzumaki, since he didn't want to save Yuzugakure from destruction only for it to be destroyed anyway. 
even though his reason was changing. He seemed to be doing it more for Kushina than for himself now. Still, she was a good kid, so Naruto didn't mind that his priorities had changed. The redhead sighed as she looked at the chain link fence around the training ground. It looked like they were trying to keep people out, or, she shivered, something else in. At that moment, the redhead, the other genin, and even Orochimaru and the other Konoha ninja didn't know that the training ground was the center of a private war between a very angry S-rank ninja and a lot of unlucky root members. Even though Naruto hadn't been inside for more than 30 minutes yet, the body count was already over 50. The blonde was a little upset that he was running out of root members, but he could get by with his subordinates until he could get to Danzo. Orochimaru walked up to the front of the group and licked his lips. Welcome, you cute little genin, to the forest of death. Please enjoy your stay, he said to the group of genin as he held up a piece of paper and smiled in a cruel way. The snake Sanin reached into his pouch and pulled out a bell. Now, I need all of you little genin to sign these papers so that Kanoha won't be responsible for your deaths. Your goals will be these bells. You'll need one for each team member to get into the central tower in the middle of the forest. There are 57 teams, so only 19 could pass. I'll tell you now that most of you won't pass. You have exactly 120 hours, or 5 days, from the moment I let you into the forest to get your 3 bells and reach the tower. Do you have any questions? Okay, my cute genin, sign the forms and bring them to the booth to get your bell. Now go. When Orochimaru was done explaining, he melted into the ground and went to do whatever he did in his spare time. Mikoto turned to her teammates and asked, Any ideas? Kushina and Nawaki quickly looked up at the sky. First of all, we don't have time to spend too much time looking for our bells. We only have five days, and the sooner we get to that tower, the better, so we have more time to rest and plan, Kushina said, before looking up again in search of ideas. As Nawaki looked into the trees, he started to frown. Nawaki added his two cents and sighed perfect place for an ambush. Using senseis and Kushina's seals as well as ordinary traps would be good. Since both your and Kushina's elements are good at cutting things, we could probably make some good improvised traps in addition to what we already have. Nakoto thought about the information she had been given and made a plan. Okay, here's the plan. When we get the bell, Kushina will seal it in her arm with Fuinjutsu. That way, it will be harder to find us using sound and it might even give us a slight advantage over the Hyuga. If their Byakugan doesn't see the bell, the white-eyed clan is less likely to bother them. Nawaki and Kushina both nodded and then stared intently at the girl. Mikoto asked Kushina, Can I assume that your sensei taught you some destructive jutsu with a wide range? Her red-headed friend nodded. Okay, when we get inside, we'll set up an ambush in the middle layer of the forest. This is where they'll see the tower and be most likely to let their guard down, if only for a moment. At first, Kushina will use a wide-range jutsu to push the team towards the traps. Once inside, they'll probably start to panic and try to run back out the way they came in. When this happens, Kushina, I want you. Kushina and Nawaki both said at the same time, as you wish, fearless leader. Nikoto just sighed. When they did that, it was weird. Team 5's three genin got their bell back and were taken to their own forest entrance. At the go signal, the three of them ran inside, but they had the feeling that someone was watching them. They didn't feel uncomfortable, but more like someone was keeping an eye on them. The three of them smiled without thinking about it, which was nice. When Naruto saw his genin team run into the forest, he smiled to himself. They were really good kids, and even though they had only known each other for a short time, Naruto cared for them more than most. Even in his own dimension, he did a lot more than what he did for most of the people in the Leaf Village. Even so, he thought it was a little strange that sometimes he would find himself just watching how Kusuna's hair caught the light or how Mikoto moved. Well, it probably wasn't anything, or at least he hoped it wasn't. Naruto heard three almost silent thumps from behind him and turned to face the three root members with a sadistic grin on his face. Raiden Chakra lit up his hands and feet, and the Yuzumaki cracked his neck from side to side with a sadistic grin. Oh, I'm so glad you guys are here. Would you three mind being my test subjects? The blonde asked. There wasn't even time for the three members of Root to scream. The wacky spun, his kunai going out wide. His opponent, a name ninja, jumped back. Senju, who had brown hair, smiled as Kushina hit the ninja from behind and knocked him out. Their plan worked perfectly. They were able to lure the other team in, trap them, and then kill them. It wasn't very impressive. A clone of Kushina had lured the aim ninja into an open clearing. From there, they set off the explosive tags in the ground, confused the three, and finished them off with Teijutsu. It was fast, brutal, and most of all effective, just like Naruto had taught them. Mikoto was looking over the three aim ninja when Nawaki looked at her and asked, Any luck? The Uchiha smiled and nodded. Yep, got one, replied Mikoto. 
She smiled as she moved a bell up and down in her hand, which made Nowaki and Kushina smile. Now that they only needed one more, they couldn't stay here even though the whole place was screaming ambush. They went back to the trees, ignoring the three aim ninja who were still sleeping on the ground. One more bell, just one more bell, and they'd be done. But that made them wonder what they should do after they'd gathered all the bells. If they followed the general rules they were given, the best thing to do would be to go to the tower. But is that really the best thing to do? At the rate they were going, they still had a lot of time. It was likely that they would get to the tower with time to spare. Maybe, after getting the bells, they should go after the other teams to cut down on the competition and all that. Nowaki shook the thoughts out of his head. He would tell Makoto what he thought if she asked, but she was really the smart one in the group, so she had probably already thought about all the options. The three genin kept going, blissfully unaware that a blonde was following them. For their own safety, of course, but Naruto wouldn't lie and say it wasn't fun to watch them beat the hell out of other genin. He just hoped they wouldn't run into an Iwa team. Kushina was definitely in Yuzumaki, and it's likely that the hidden stone is out for revenge. Naruto sucked in air like it was water. It hadn't taken him long to kill the three Rude NBU, but the work he had done in the last hour was starting to show. The blonde wasn't a god, and even with Akane fixing him up, using his incomplete rate and no Yoroi was hurting his body. The blonde took a big drink of water from his canteen, which he had just opened. He had killed 63 people so far that day, but Naruto was sure that the Rude NBU had left the forest. Either that, or he had underestimated how good they were at hiding. No matter what, Naruto's job didn't change. He still had to keep an eye on his team to make sure they didn't get taken by Root or anyone else. The blonde was reminded of a story his mother had told him about being taken by Kumo and being saved by his father. If Naruto was right, Kumo did that not only because Kushina had a unique chakra, but also because she was the last Yuzumaki. Since there was still an entire village left, Kumo might not even try this time. On the other hand, if Kumo had wanted to try, the second exam would have been the best time. The blonde sighed and closed his eyes as he leaned back against a tree. He wasn't a god. People had called him one before, a living god of war, to be exact. But Naruto wasn't so cocky as to think he was one. All of his plans that had worked so far were a combination of dumb luck, good bluffs, and the occasional Kato Matsukami. But Naruto wasn't stupid. He knew he couldn't keep going like this. Eventually, people would ask him about his past, and he would have to be able to answer them. Naruto grimaced because he knew he had to start working on his plan right away. The blonde made a shadow clone, which took off because it knew what its creator wanted. Naruto shook off his thoughts and turned back to his team. He needed to be focused right now, and he wouldn't let any mistakes happen. Mikoto ran with her team through the forest. Every other genin team would call this a sprint. Find another team, fight them, win, take the bell, and run like hell back to the tower. That was all they had to do. She had thought about staying outside to cut down on the competition, but decided against it. Even though the idea was good in theory, it wasn't very good in practice. The other teams could have attacked them back, and by the time they got to the tower, they would be too tired to fight. After her sensei took the Chunin exams, Mikoto did some research on them. The third phase was always a fight between two people, and it always took one day to finish. That meant that the second round had to get the number of participants down to a level that was acceptable. And if that didn't work, a preliminary round had to be thought about. No, the best plan would be to go to the tower as soon as they heard the third bell and let the forest, and the preliminary rounds do the hard work for them. That was a good plan. The biggest problem with their plan was how long it would take to get another bell. People who didn't get a bell or whose bells were stolen or broken would start to crowd the area around the tower if they took too long. Time was of the essence as they tried to take the bells from the teams that had already finished the job and were likely tired and hurt. That meant they couldn't waste any time. They had to get a bell and leave quickly. The black-haired Achiha landed quietly on a branch that overlooked a small clearing. It wasn't what she was looking for, but it would do for now. All that was left to do was set the trap. Mikoto turned back to her team with a shark-like grin on her face and started giving them orders with only hand gestures. Naruto had beaten the need for silent communication into the heads of all three of his charges, and he hadn't stopped until they could all communicate perfectly in silent code. If any ANB you had been watching at that exact moment, they would have been baffled as to how a genin, of all people, knew the silent code. The plan for the ambush was simple. The clearing was wide and open, making it a good place for an ambush. However, no ninja worth his or her salt would jump into it without first checking for dangers. Team 5's plan was simple. They would make the ambush so obvious that anyone who had been trained in ambush and counter-ambush tactics would be able to see it coming from a mile away. Something Naruto said every ninja should know, but not enough of them did. 
When that training was brought up, it still made Nawaki shiver. For some reason, the Senju had it worse than his other two teammates during that training. Even though the ambush was very clear, that was the point. The ambush would be so silly that no team would take it seriously. When Team 5 showed up, the other team wouldn't think much of them because of how bad their ambush was, so they wouldn't be taken seriously. It would be the mistake that cost the other team their bell and, if it came down to it, maybe their lives. But like any good Jinjutsu, the ambush she was planning had two parts to it as well. The surface traps for the ambush were easy to see, but the ones she thought would hurt her weren't. The log that was hanging over the clearing could kill someone if it hit them. It was also set up so that it was very obvious that it was there, and it gave anyone it attacked 12 ways to get away. But each of these landing zones was infected with an airborne poison that had no taste, smell, or color and would slow down their opponent's movements and reaction times. It was a poison, but every member of Team 5 had an antidote on them, so they didn't get sick. Once the person hit the poison field, they wouldn't notice a drop in their abilities right away. Instead, they would run away when the ninja wire and exploding tags showed up, which was again very obvious. The next trap was the explosion itself, which made the enemy avoid them. The explosive tags had a substance inside that made the poison work faster and gave the people they were meant to hurt three ways to get away. Each path led to an equally obvious wire trap. If their opponents knew about their traps, they would have been able to avoid the trap before it went off. Except that they wouldn't think about the poison or the fact that, unlike the other wire traps, this one would go off in less than 5 of a second. Overall, Mikoto thought it was a pretty good plan. They wouldn't know that the wires were covered in a poison that would knock them out. Kushina hummed as she put down another powerful tag. Even though the redhead sometimes hated her sensei, she had to admit that he knew a lot about explosives. Kushina almost begged to learn how to make 10 bangs that were all the same size. Naruto finally got tired of her constantly asking him to show her how to make his special explosive tags, so he made a deal with his tiny mother. If Kushina made it to the final rounds of the Chunin exams, he would teach her how to make the tags and work with her on Fuinjutsu so she could learn more about her clan's specialty. Kushina honestly thought that it was an odd relationship that the others and she had with their sensei. Naruto was more like an older brother or best friend to the trio of Genin than a sensei, well most of the time anyway. Kushina didn't know a single team besides her own that had such a close relationship with their sensei. While it was true that every team eventually became close with their teachers very few of them ever grew into the same kind of sibling relationship that Team 5 had with Naruto. Even when the relationship between teacher and student grew so close in other teams it was normally only with one student not the entire team. The redhead smiled to herself as she began to place the ninja wire around the clearing. Nawaki and Mikoto were in charge of their own areas. When she had first arrived in Kanoha Kushina wasn't treated very well. Her red hair made her an outsider and despite being one of the more open villages when it came to trade and commerce if there was one thing that Kanoha disliked it was outsiders. Even if those outsiders were related to their Shodai Hakage's wife, the fact that Kushina was the Jinchuriki of Kubai did not help matters. As the redhead was the only Yuzumaki living in Kanoha she had no one to rely on. Some of the people inside Kanoha had even said things when they thought she couldn't hear them saying that she had been sent off from her clan because she was a disgrace or something like that and Kanoha had been nice enough to pick her up. What made Kushina mad was that even if she told them what she knew to be true, that her clan, her father, her mother, her sisters and her brother still loved her when the people of Kanoha asked back then why did they make you come here? Kushina couldn't answer them. The redhead could hardly just come out and say my family sent me here to become the next Jinchuriki of the Kubai to keep you all safe. Well actually now that she thought about it Kushina decided that she probably could say that but it would make more problems than it would solve. Sure telling the people of Kanoha that would stop them talking about how her family had supposedly abandoned her behind her back but it would also make them see her as a monster. Kushina knew how the Jinchuriki were treated in other villages. Her life in Kanoha wasn't what she wanted it to be. She didn't have her family nearby. She couldn't see her father and mother or her brothers and sisters whenever she wanted but her life in Kanoha could also be a whole lot worse. The redhead tightened the last piece of ninja wire and pulled it into place. To be honest Kushina had been lonely in Kanoha, very lonely. It was only in her third year in the academy that she had finally gotten a friends in Mikoto-chan and Nawaki kun but even then she was still lonely. Sure friends helped but they didn't fill the void. Family, she wanted a family. On her birthdays Kushina never really got much. That being said the redhead couldn't really expect much considering that she didn't have any family in the village. But until Nawaki and Mikoto had come along she hadn't even gotten a happy birthday from anyone. It was one of the reasons that she was grateful to have Naruto as a sensei. 
Most teams of Genin became fast friends, best friends. People who watched each other's backs and protected each other. Slowly but surely Team 5 had become something more. Somehow from the soul-crushing training to the days they just spent together enjoying each other's company. And even sneaking into Naruto Sensei's house with Makoto and Nawaki to wake the blonde up Team 5 had become something more. The dysfunctional four had become a kind of makeshift family. It was a reason that Kushina wanted to thank her sensei but didn't know how to. Because, thanks in some ways, a lot of ways, to him, she wasn't alone anymore. It was also the reason that Kushina liked spending time at Naruto's apartment as often as she could, for as long as she could. Because she was trying to do for the blonde what Naruto had done for her. Kushina wasn't sure if Nawaki and Mikoto had noticed it but the blonde never talked about his family and very rarely about his friends. More importantly when he did talk about them it was always things like Ino loved flowers like that. Or Choji used to love meals like that. He always talked about the things that his friends loved when he spoke of them. Which was very little. Naruto always talked about the things that his friends loved. About the world his friends loved. Not even once had Kushina heard Naruto speak about the world that he loved. From the slight amount of melancholy that Naruto had when spoke of them Kushina was able to deduce one thing. The blonde's friends, his family, they were all dead. Or at the very least Naruto could no longer see them. Kushina had come up with a goal for herself after she came to that conclusion. She would do for her sensei what he had done for her. Kushina had decided to show Naruto that he wasn't alone anymore. Kushina jumped back into the trees and settled in to wait. While the work of setting up the trap had been good for her to reminisce and think now it was time to get her head back into the game and perform like a real ninja again. The poor bastards that dropped into this trap would never know what hit them, of that Kushina felt assured. Naruto couldn't help the yawn that came out of his mouth as his genin team made a beeline for the tower after dispatching a team of tacky men. The trap had gone off exactly the way his three cute little genin had intended it to. The three tacky men were poisoned and tied up in ninja wire before they could blink. From there it was a simple knock to the back of their heads with Kunai by his genin and they were away with their last bell. Naruto had checked the time as well. At the rate that Makoto, Nawaki and Kushina were moving they would finish the entire second segment in around an hour and twenty. Take that Gara. Well at least this job had been easy. Thankfully he had been able to force Root to retreat before any teams got too far into the forest. Otherwise things would have gotten messy. Naruto couldn't help the smile that came to his face as he saw his genin enter the tower. Naruto unsealed a clock and looked down. 1 hour 17 minutes. Ha. Take. That. G-A-A-R-A. -A -A. The black-haired blonde took off his mask and sealed it away before using the henge to hide his now black hair, returning it to it normal golden blonde. Not a moment too soon. Naruto felt like his body was stretched for a second before vanishing in a puff of smoke only to reappear inside the tower and facing his, surprised as all hell, Jen and team. Naruto just gave them one lazy wave. Yo. So this was it for today. I will continue the story in next part. Till then, we weep offline.